this morning. We're so thankful that you're with us, that you are with us, that you're with us, that you even gave your own son the name Emmanuel, God with us, Lord, to show us that you would be so willing to be with us, you would be so willing to be right by our side that you would actually send your son to become one of us, that he would become a man, that he would take on flesh, that he would become everything it means to be in our weakness, to be tempted in every way as we are, that we might know in every single situation we find ourselves in. We look up and we see a God who knows exactly where we are, who is literally in our shoes, who is right by our side. God, we're so thankful that in your grace you came, that you humbled yourself. Lord, that you even made yourself a servant, that Jesus was willing, Lord, even to be humbled to the point of death on a cross. God, this morning we just want to have your love and your grace wash over us again. We, we come in weary, we come in tired, we come in knowing the guilt of our sin. And Lord, we long to hear from your word your truth about your son, Jesus. We want to meet with you here. We want to feast with you, to enjoy you as we hear your word today. So God, we humbly open ourselves up. We humbly submit ourselves to your word. We ask that you would lead us this morning to the place where we, we are able to rejoice in the hope that you've given us in Christ. It's in his name that we worship and pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're uh, taking your seat, uh, I want to ask you to do two things. First, I want to ask you to take your Bible out and open to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Uh, the other thing I want to try to do is ask you to multitask, which is never a good idea. Uh, but I just want to make a few announcements about some things that are going on uh, right now in the life of the church. So as you turn to, to Psalm 110, here, here's a few things. First of all, uh, tonight, we're going to be continuing in our Sunday seminar uh, where we're learning how to have a personal Bible study. Last week, we kicked off uh, and, and we spent a lot of time talking about just what it looks like to open our Bibles and just begin to, to see uh, what God is saying to us. And so tonight at six o'clock, we'll continue that. And then we have one more week next week with that. So I'd love for you to come. Even if you weren't there last week, consider coming back out uh, tonight to learn how to study the Bible. Um, also, next Sunday, uh, we have sort of two things that are mashed together. Uh, we both have a, a, a membership class, so if you're somebody here, you've been, you've been around the church for a little while, and you're interested in becoming a, an official member of this church, joining the family, uh, next Sunday after the second service, we would invite you to lunch, stick around, and then for about 30, 45 minutes after, we, we, we'll tell you how you can uh, become a part of the family here at Palmetto Shores Church. But also, maybe you have been around and you're, you're like, whoa, I'm not ready for membership, but I do want to get to know some other people. Uh, we'll also invite you to come to that lunch. You can just come to lunch, hang, hang out, get to know some other people, and then instead of staying for the membership portion, uh, you can just, just head home. Uh, and then the final thing I want to, uh, to mention is that on June 4th, uh, we're going to be having a fam family members meeting, and we're actually going to have it at night so that we can have dinner together. So we'll meet at 5 o'clock on June f uh, 4th for business, and then at 5.30, we're going to have uh, some food. So uh, we'd love for you to come out. And if you're not a member and you want to come out and, and have dinner with us, we would love for you to join us on June 4th uh, at 5.30. So mark your calendars for that. Now, to God's Word, Psalm 110. Psalm 110. A Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. 
This is the word of the Lord. Um, some of you, you may know, some of you may not, uh, but our daughter, Leighton, uh, had eye surgery on Monday. I just want to report uh, that, it, that the surgery went well and Leighton is recovering. Uh, she actually made it out to the to Pelicans baseball game last night, which was exciting. Uh, when we arrived for Leighton's surgery, we checked in and there was this nice man there at the desk who, who told us that, that uh, throughout the, the, the surgery in the waiting room, there was going to be a monitor on the wall that was going to be giving us live updates of, of where Leighton was and kind of what was going on. And, and we were really excited about that. That was, a, that was an awesome treat to know that we were going to get to kind of watch her uh, on the screen through the surgery. Not literally watch her, but just have updates through the surgery. So uh, Leighton goes back. We, we go to the waiting area. And when we get there, the, the screen's blank. And about 15 minutes goes by, and I, I get the nudge to go up and talk to the man. So I, you know, I walk up to the man and I, and say, uh, you know, hey, uh, you know, not trying to cause a problem, but, you know, you told us there was going to be some updates on the, on the screen and there's nothing there. And a really nice guy, he immediately gets up and he comes over to the monitor and he starts, you know, you know pulling on wires and turning it on and off and everything. And, and after a few minutes goes by, uh, there, there's nothing coming up on the screen. It's blank. Uh, so I have to go walk back over to Allie and tell her that we're actually not going to be getting updates uh, throughout Layton's surgery. Well, then a few minutes later, the doors bust open, and the doctor comes walking right towards us. And she, began to tell, she begins to tell us that, that everything went great, that latent surgery went fine, that she's in recovery, that she's breathing on her own. And in that moment, even though we hadn't yet laid our eyes on Leighton, that word from the doctor changed everything. For, for a moment, it was a little bit of anxiety there, but in that moment, when we heard from the doctor the truth about what had gone on, Behind the, the closed doors, we could breathe again. And that is the purpose of Psalm 110 in our Bibles. Psalm 110 is God showing us life from His perspective. God showing up in the midst of our trouble, in the midst of a world that feels to us like it's in chaos. And He speaks a word to us that calms us, that gives us peace that shows us that actually he's in control. See, in these seasons of trouble that we all find ourselves in, uh, we're tempted to ask God, God, what is going on? How could this possibly be part of your, your plan? God, what are you doing in the world? And when we have those moments of fear, it, it can really cripple us. It, it can take over us. We can be so discouraged that we, we don't know how to move forward. But then we open God's Word, and as, as it says in Romans chapter 15, God's Word is full of encouragement and hope. And God, in a psalm like Psalm 110, He cuts right through all of our fear, all of our worry, all of our regrets. And He shows us that, no, 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 there is good news that He is in control, that He is on the throne, that we can trust Him in the midst of our trouble. And so as we work through Psalm 110 this morning, we're going to encounter five hope-filled realities, five hope-filled realities uh, from what is one of the most popular psalms. This psalm gets quoted more than, uh, sorry, this, this psalm gets quoted 27 times in the New Testament, which means this is a very, very, very important psalm. And so five hope-filled realities this morning. The first truth that we encounter is that this world is not out of control. This world is not out of control. Verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So David is the author of this psalm, but David is an onlooker. David is an onlooker witnessing a conversation between two persons. And the two persons that David is witnessing a a conversation between are God the Father and God the Son. This is a divine conversation. And so what is it that David overhears God the Father say to Jesus? Well, he overhears God the Father say to Jesus, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. For David, this was a future vision. This was something that was going to happen in the future. And, and David was a man whose life was full of trouble. 
David had trouble in the kingdom that he ruled. David had trouble in his own family. And David had trouble in his life because of, the, because of his own decisions. He had made some really poor choices. And at times it felt like life was crashing in on David. But God, in his love for David, he, he showed him this vision. He showed him that in the future, one of his great, 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 great grandsons was going to be exalted and seated at the right hand of God. But guys, here, here's the reality for us. As great as that was for David to get that future vision, it's even more encouraging for us because this is a picture of the present. That right now at this very moment, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I've learned uh, now, after a few years of having kids, uh, what is the best part of the day for a young mother? The meal has been cooked and eaten. The, the dishes have been washed and put away. All the toys have been put back in their bin, even though they're going to be all taken all back out tomorrow. All the work has been done. Everything that needs to happen. And then a young mother enters her glory and sits down. Everything is under control. For a few minutes, there is silence. When Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father after His resurrection, He was in effect saying, I have overcome the world. In John 16, 33, right before Jesus went to the cross and then rose from the dead and then ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father, Jesus said to His disciples, I have said these things to you that in Me you may have peace in the world, here's a promise, you will have tribulation. But here's another promise, take heart. I have overcome the world. To know that over every single situation that you and I see, every single situation that you and I might find ourselves in, what we look up when we see in the heavens is we see the exalted Jesus sitting, seated. And the difference between a mother's rest and Jesus' rest is that the next morning, the mother has to get back up and do it all over again and get back up and do it all over again and get back up and do it all, all over again. But Jesus Christ has seated and he has entered his eternal rest. There is no more work to be done. Everything that God the Father has given Jesus, Jesus to do, he has accomplished. And he now sits reigning in control. Let me tell you what Jesus is not doing right now. Jesus is not pacing. Jesus is not sweating. Jesus is not wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. Jesus is not breathing heavily. Jesus is not taking a nap. Jesus is not distracted. Right now, at this very moment, Jesus is seated on his throne. Jesus is ruling and reigning over whatever chaos you and I think we see, over whatever seems to be out of control in our lives, Jesus sits enthroned above it. But here's the problem. Uh, when, we look at, when we look around, we're, we aren't always able to see how it is that Jesus could be in control. We aren't able to see how it is that when Jesus said in Matthew 28 that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, it's hard for us to imagine that. Because we, we see a world that, that seems to be in dysfunction, that seems to be in trouble. But verse 2 of this psalm helps us understand God's plan for Christ's reign. Look at verse 2. It says, The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. And, and here's, what, here's what the Father says to the Son. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So right at this very moment, God is extending the rule of Jesus all throughout the world, inviting anyone, by the way, anyone who wants to come under the reign of King Jesus, they are invited. But it seems counterintuitive to us because here's what God has done. God has established the reign of Jesus, the rule of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus in the midst of his enemies. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Uh, he, here's a way for us to understand why God would do this. Uh, I don't know about you, I don't go to the mall very often anymore. 
Uh, but recently I, I went to the mall and I made a big mistake by bringing my son with me. Now, I don't want you to get, get the wrong impression. I love spending time with my son. But here's the reason I say that it was a, a big mistake for me to bring my son with me. The people who have crafted the mall are geniuses. They know that at every single turn, down every single aisle, everywhere, all throughout the mall, there are enticing things for kids to play with. There are flashing lights. There are exciting sounds. There are sweet smells rising up in the air. And right at the center of the Myrtle Beach Mall is this big, huge trampoline thing that you get strapped into and jump up and down. This is not fair. When God the Father says to Jesus, I am going to put your rule in the midst of your enemies, the reason he does that is because some of those enemies will see the beauty and wonder and glory of Jesus and they will want in on it. They will see what it looks like to live under the reign of Jesus and they will say, I want Jesus to be my king. Jesus offers everything that we could ever long for. This is how John Calvin says it in his Institutes. He says, if we seek salvation, we are taught by the very name of Jesus that it is, that it is of him. If we seek any other gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in his anointing. If we seek strength, it lies in his dominion. If purity, in his conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal, in his condemnation, if remission of the curse, in his cross, if satisfaction, in his sacrifice, if purification, in his blood, if reconciliation, in his descent into hell, if mortification of the flesh, in his tomb, if newness of life, in the resurrection, if immortality, in the same, if inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, in his entrance into heaven, if protection, if security, if abundant supply of all blessings in his kingdom, if untroubled expectation of judgment in the power given to him to judge. In short, since rich store of every kind of good abounds in him, let us drink our fills from this fountain and from no other. What is the point of what John Calvin is trying to say? He's like saying, think of something you want. Think of something you need. Think of something your heart desires. It is found in Jesus Christ. Do you need to be forgiven? It's found in Jesus. Do you need someone to help you lead your life? It's found in King Jesus. Do you need someone to satisfy your soul? It is found in Jesus. And the time period that you and I find ourselves in is the time when God has established the rule of Jesus in the midst of his enemies. And aren't we glad? Because once we were enemies... And then we were brought in. And so what is our role now? Our role now is to get Jesus clearly seen all around us and then to get out of the way. Right? If we would just make Jesus seen in our lives and we would proclaim him clearly from this church and then we were to step into the background, many, many, many of Christ's enemies will be drawn in to find all that their hearts have ever desired in him. That's good news. It's good news. And it's helpful, right? I mean, we look around, it's like, ah, what's going on? This is what's going on. Okay. Second this morning, our second hope-filled truth is that there is a leader worth following. There is a leader worth following. Verse 3 says, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. So verse 3 is God the Father. He's still talking to Jesus. But as he talks to Jesus, he begins to talk about the people of Jesus. So this is an interesting verse. We're hearing God the Father talk about us. Talk about us us. But what it says about us actually says something more about who Jesus is. Let me, let me explain this to you. 
uh, the movie The Knight's Tale. A Knight's Tale uh, is about a, about a boy named William Thatcher, and he dreams about growing up to become a knight. And he actually gets the opportunity to, to pretend to be a knight, and, and he actually ends up doing pretty good. He's good at jousting, he's good at fighting with the sword, and, and so he gets, he gets the opportunity to fake it and to, to become a knight, but eventually he gets found out. And towards the end of the movie, when he, when he gets found out, he gets put in the stocks. And you know, you've seen the scene before, maybe not in this movie, but some other movie where you know, the, the crowd is surrounded around him, they're jeering at him, they're yelling at him, they're throwing lettuce at his face, they're throwing tomatoes at him, and the only people who are sticking by his side are his few loyal men. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of the crowd, while the crowd's jeering and yelling and shouting at him, Prince Edward steps forward, and, and a hush comes over the crowd. And Prince Edward leans in to William Thatcher, and he says, Your men love you. If I knew nothing else, that would be enough. It's a powerful line. Your men love you. If I knew nothing else, that would be enough. See, we actually learn something about a leader by the people who follow them. When the people who follow someone love their leader, when they love the person who is in charge of them, when they love the person who's over them, it tells us that that person is not demanding, is not exacting, is not someone who sucks life from you, What it says is that that leader is a leader who gives life to you. And that's why God the Father says to Jesus here in verse 3, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. Jesus is a king who people freely offer themselves to. Why? Because Jesus is a king who loves his people. Jesus is a king who serves his people. Jesus is a king who who heals his people. So let's honestly ask this morning, is he worthy of following who came from heaven to earth to save us? Is he worth following who humbled himself to become a servant and even now serves us to bring about his good pleasure in our lives? Is he worth following who, while we were enemies, he came after us and made us his friends? Is he worth following who died on a cross in the place of sinners? Is he worth following who promises us that he will be loyal and faithful to us even when at times we are not loyal and faithful to him? Is he worth following? Guys, there's never been anyone who was more worth the allegiance of our hearts. Now, after saying that his people will offer themselves freely, God the Father continues. Again, he's talking, God the Father's talking to Jesus, but he's talking about his people. And so I want to read all of verse 3 again. It says, Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will will be yours. Now, the poetry at the end of verse 3 is a little bit obscure, a little bit confusing, but here's what we can gather, at least, at the minimum, from verse 3, is that Jesus' people belong to Him, and they dress themselves in holy garments. What does that mean? Well, this is what it means. When God the Father talks to Jesus, and and He tells Jesus what His people will be like, He's saying they will be people who are fully devoted to Jesus. They will be people who are set apart to Jesus. They will be people who it is obviously marked in their life that they are aligned with Jesus. Uh, When I was in college, I played one year of football at Coastal Carolina. Didn't didn't ever play, but I was on the team for a year. And in the first few weeks uh, that I was there, I walked into the, the workout facility one day, and one of my coaches just came up to me out of nowhere and said, start running laps. And I was a little bit confused, but I didn't want to argue, and so I, I just start running. And a few minutes go, go by, and he says, stop. And he comes over to me, and he says, why did you think it would be acceptable to wear that shirt to practice today? And at that moment, I hadn't even realized what I, did, what I had done. I looked down, and I was wearing a Duke University t-shirt. Now, listen, 
I'm not a Duke fan. I don't even know how I got the Duke shirt. But my coach's point was this. You can't play for Coastal and represent another team. You can't say that you're fully devoted to this team if you're going to wear the shirt for the other team. You can't come in to this facility at this university wearing some other garments, wearing some other jersey. That's not okay here. And what God is saying to Jesus, what God the Father is saying to Jesus in this psalm is he's saying the people of Jesus, they devote themselves to Jesus. They are set apart to Jesus. It is evident and obvious from the way they live their life that they belong to him. As we're really excited today, in the second service, we're going to be having two baptisms. Two people at the end of the second service are going to be dunked under the waters to celebrate the fact that they have devoted their life to Jesus. They have said, Christ gave himself for me, and so I am giving myself to him. They are being marked forever for the rest of their life that they are holy, set apart, devoted to Christ. But here's the call for all of us who have been baptized into Jesus. The call for all of us is to actually live the baptized life. And what the baptized baptized life means is that our devotion to Jesus isn't mainly found in some commitment we made a long, long, long time ago when we were baptized. No, our commitment to Jesus is found in a daily lifestyle of offering up our whole selves to Him This is why Paul in Romans 12, 1 said, Therefore, in view of God's mercies, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your acceptable act of worship. What's Paul saying? He's saying if this is who Jesus is, if this is what God has done for us in Christ, if this is what he has done to save us, to rescue us from our sin, to bring us back into his family, then all we can say in return is, Lord, take my life. Use me. I'm yours. I belong to you. I'm set apart to you. In the next verse of the psalm, in verse 4, we're going to see an unexpected twist. Uh, David seemingly sees another picture that at first feels like it changes the story. But I think as we're going to see in a moment, uh, it's right in line with what we're talking about this morning. And so third today, our third hope-filled reality is that our future is not hanging in the balance. Our future is not hanging in the balance. Uh, Verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, One of the most crippling things for all of us in life is fear of the future. Fear of the future. Maybe it's that we look around in the world and we're afraid of what's coming. Uh, Maybe it's that we look into our own life and we're afraid of what might happen, of what could potentially come. And that fear of the future, it it makes us live at times as if maybe life is hanging in the balance. Maybe our world is hanging in the balance. Maybe my salvation is hanging in the balance. But if we knew that there was such a God who promised to secure a bright future for His people, if we knew that there was a God who had committed Himself to bringing His people safe to heaven with Him, if we knew there was a God who poured out His power and His strength on behalf of His people to secure them forever, then the only question left would be this. If that God exists, if there is a God who is so good and who has promised those things to His people, then the only question left for us to ask is, how do I know that I am on His side? How do I know that this God is for me? How do I know that my future with Him is secure? And one of the Bible's answers is found here in in this psalm in verse 4. The assurance 
that God gives to us, that our future is not hanging in the balance, is found in the fact that Jesus is not only our king, but that Jesus is also our priest. Jesus is also our priest. And in this verse, in, in Psalm 110.4, God reveals to David that Jesus will be a king who is a priest like a man named Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek is a man who's only mentioned one other time in the Old Testament. And Hebrews chapter 7, really all throughout Hebrews, but specifically Hebrews chapter 7, shows us the significance of how Melchizedek and Jesus resemble each other. And so I, I want to read a few verses to you from Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, I'll start with verses 1 through 3. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. He's saying Melchizedek just means, that's all the name means, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. And here is the key phrase that Psalm 110 picks up on. Resembling the Son of God, He continues a priest forever. That is going to be the point of this whole thing, that he continues as a priest forever. So Melchizedek was a priest king who resembled Jesus. Uh, here's just a quick help, helpful understanding for us. The kings of Israel represented God to the people. The kings represented God to the people. But the priests represent the people to God. They stand as a representative of the people to God. So kings represent God to the people. Priests represent the people to God. And this is the beauty of what David sees in this psalm. What he sees is that Jesus, his great, 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 great grandson, would be both. That Jesus would both represent God to the people, but he would also represent his people to God. Um, let's say uh, you're given access uh, to a certain sort of club or, or, um, or membership or something like this because you have a relationship with someone else. So it's not that you have the right or the ability to, to be a part of something, but because you know somebody, you have the right to get in. They're members, they're in, they play at this certain golf course or they have access to this certain thing. And because you have that relationship, you are given access to that thing. That is what it means that Jesus is our priest. Jesus has access to God. Jesus has access to heaven. Jesus has access to all of God's blessings, all the things that you and I do not have access to. And so we need someone to represent us. We need someone who will give us access. And that's what it means that Jesus is our priest. And that is what brings us to the heart of the gospel, that you and I were sinners you and I, we don't deserve to have a relationship with God. We don't deserve to have a bright future. What you and I deserve is a future where we pay for the punishment of our sin forever. That's what we deserve. That is what our future should be. But God, being rich in mercy, God, being full of kindness, God, out of the love in His heart, He sent His Son Jesus into this world. And as our representative, as the person who gives us access Jesus lives a perfect life. He dies on the cross in the place of sinners, and then he rises from the dead. Why? Why does Jesus do that? Why is he living this life, dying on this cross, rising from the dead? Why is he doing this? So that anyone who places their faith in him now has him as their representative. Jesus now represents us to God. Jesus now gives us access to God, access to God's blessings, access to heaven itself. In Hebrews 7, 23 through 25, uh, the Bible continues to show the resemblance between Melchizedek and Jesus. And, and this is sort of the thrust. This is why this matters. Hebrews 7, 23 through 25 says this, The former priests were many in number 
because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, talking about Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, consequently, that means here's the so what. This is why this matters. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right now, this very moment, Christ is seated in the heavens, yes, as the victorious king, but also as our representative. Right now, Jesus gives us access to God. Right now, Jesus secures the fact that God is for us, that he's on our side. And consequently, as Hebrews 7.25 says, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, when you get access to some club or some membership through a friend, through, a per, through another person, you know, when, when that relationship is good, then it's, then it's great. But when you have access to something through another person, if something goes wrong with that person, you lose access. Uh, if that, that person cancels their membership, if, if something bad happens to them, if something comes in between the relationship between you and them, you now no longer have access But the point of what Hebrews 7 is trying to say, the reason that David sees this vision of Jesus as a priest who is a priest forever, is that the one who gives us access, he's not going anywhere. The one who gives us access, he's always there forever and ever and ever. There is no scenario in which the person who has put their faith in Christ does not have a secured, bright future. And here's why. What secures our future is God. And the way we are secure with God is through Jesus. And so if we're in Christ, our future is secure. If we have sinned, if we have slidden back, here is this high priest, one of my favorite songs, Before the Throne of God. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. And I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. Man, what a confident hope that our anchor, as the other song says, is anchored within the veil. (laughs) The anchor that holds our life, it is in the presence of God. That Jesus Christ, seated, gives us access, and he's not going anywhere. So our lives are not hanging in the balance. Uh, Once David sees who Jesus is, it it comes together as this powerful image of encouragement. Uh, What we're going to see now as we move from verses 1 to 4 to to 5 through 7 is something interesting. God is still speaking... And he's still speaking in a way about Jesus, but but the conversation changes. God the Father is no longer talking to Jesus. Now God the Father is talking to David about Jesus. And so forth, the fourth truth, the fourth hope-filled reality that we see this morning is that we are not alone. That we are not alone. Verse 5 says, The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. So God the Father was talking to the Son, but now he turns and he's talking to David. And this is an absolutely unbelievable image. If we've been walking through this so far and we get to this point in the passage, we can't help but feel the force of this. That in verse 1, God the Father said to Jesus, sit at my right hand. But now in verse 5, God turns to David and says, The Lord, talking about Jesus, is at your right hand. So who is it that God wants David to know is right at his side, is right with him? It is none other than the one who is seated at the right hand of God. Who is it that God wants David to know is right at his side? It is none other than his high priest who lives forever. 
So have you ever needed someone to come to your side? Have you ever needed to be strengthened? Have you ever needed someone to stand beside you? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy about his life. And he talks about a time when everybody in his life deserted him. Uh, he talks about a time when it was that moment, you know, when, when, when other people needed to kind of put their skin in the game with Paul. And instead of sticking it out with him, everybody bailed. And this is what Paul says. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 18. He says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But, Paul says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me my message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul tells Timothy, hey, when I was in a moment of crisis, everybody in my life deserted me. Everybody that I thought I could trust, they left me, but there was one. There was one who was with me. The Lord. The Lord was with me. And that was enough. The strength of the Lord carried Paul when everyone else had left him. So, Simply, we just have to ask this morning, have you been abandoned? The Lord is with you. Are you trying with everything in you to, to live out God, God's will for your life while everyone else around you seems to be going in the opposite direction? The Lord is with you. Do you feel like you're just pouring yourself out and that you have gotten all the way down to the, to the emptiness of your tank? and you've got nothing left to give, the Lord is with you. And the Lord who is with us, the Lord who is at our right hand, is none other than the one who is seated at the right hand of God. None other than the one who is this great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for his people. And oh, by the way, Verse 5 tells us, He will shatter kings on the day of His wrath. Why does God add that? The Lord is with you. He will shatter kings on the day of His wrath. Well, God wants us to know that, yes, Jesus was a lamb who laid down His life for His people, but Jesus is also the lion who is our champion, who is our king, whom none can contend with. Last week... Uh, Allie called me somewhat frantically, and uh, over the phone she said, can you come meet me where I am right now? Uh, She had uh, made a purchase on uh, Facebook Marketplace. And when she arrived at the destination uh, where she was supposed to pick pick up the, the thing that we were getting, it was a storage unit. And Allie said to me, I have watched way too much crime TV, and I feel like I'm going to get abducted and st- stuck in this Uh, storage unit, and I will never see you again. I need you. Um, And so I went to her knowing that, you know, I could bash some teeth in if I needed to. You know, I could could shatter some kings. I could do some some business. And with with me, with the strength of me with, with her, she was able to move forward. She was able to press ahead and do what she needed to do. What this psalm is is, is trying to encourage us. God is looking at our life saying, I know you're troubled. I know you're weak. I know you're weird. I know you don't have what it takes. I know that life is too hard for you. I know that there are things that are are scary. I know that it seems like the world's in chaos. I know it feels like your future is, is hanging in the balance, but there is one at your side, and he shatters kings. There is one at your side, and he is seated at the right hand of God. There is one at your side, and that ought to fill us with courage, courage both in life and in death. That in life, yes, we have one who's at our side, but even in death, even as we face that, that day when, our, when God's allotted time for us runs out and we face that day, we face it with one at our side who's already conquered death. 
And that brings us to our last hope-filled reality today. The final truth we see in the psalm is that good will triumph over evil. Good will triumph over evil. Verses 6 and 7 round out this wonderfully hopeful psalm by saying, He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Last week, we talked about God's justice. We talked about why we need God's justice. We talked about how it happens that we go from being someone who, whose God's, God's justice is against to be, being someone who's, who's God's, whom God's justice is for. But what we didn't talk about is how God's justice will be finally executed. And here in Psalm 110, we see how God's justice will finally be executed. And what we see is that it is actually Jesus. It is God's Son who will execute His final justice. And on that day, there will will be two radically different responses. For those who rejected Christ, for those who did not put their trust in the Savior... For those who did not glorify God, but their whole life suppressed the truth of God, that will be a day of vengeance. Where Jesus comes and he takes out vengeance, as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, on anyone who did not obey his gospel. But But it will be a very different experience for those who had put their faith in Jesus. For those who had put their trust in Jesus, when they see Jesus come to carry out God's justice, it will be a day of rejoicing. It will be a day when for the first time, the one whom they'd only ever seen by faith, they now see with their own eyes. They see the one whom their heart had longed for. They see him face to face. Good will triumph over evil because Jesus has triumphed over evil. Uh, So how, how should we think about Psalm 110? Uh, when Allie and I were at the doctor's office and uh, at the hospital and the surgery was going on, man, it, it made it worse you know, that they told us we were supposed to get updates, right? We, we, we wanted to see, we wanted to know, we wanted to be able to see what was going on. We wanted, we wanted to be able to understand exactly where we were in the process. And that is what God does for us in Psalm 110. God shows us a picture of today in heaven. You know, news from heaven today. It was the same as yesterday, and it'll be the same tomorrow. And the news from heaven is that Jesus is still seated on his throne. That our high priest is sitting, and there is no more work to do. He has accomplished redemption, and he lives to ever intercede for us. And then this psalm shows us the picture of the future. It gives us a glimpse of what will happen on that final day when we have put our trust in Him, when we put our hope in Him. And this is what we see in the psalm. The one who lifts their head in victory is Jesus. And if we are in Him, then we will lift our head in victory as well. This is God's perspective on life today. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful that you know our weaknesses. You understand that we are but dust And that you know that frail, weak vessels like us, Lord, we need encouragement. We need your hope. We need your vision. We need to be able to see what you're seeing. Because, Lord, to us, your plan is hard to to accept. It's hard to believe that you are all wise. It's hard to believe that you understand exactly what you're doing, that, that your plan to have your son rule in the midst of his enemies, that's hard for us, Lord, because... All we see is trouble. All we feel is the chaos. But God, this morning we humbly submit 
to your vision. We humbly submit to your, your plan and we ask that you would align our hearts to yours. God, would you bring our hearts in alignment that we might have strength, courage, and hope that the one who is seated at the right hand is right beside us. God, would you transform our day to day as we, by faith, trust that the Lord is with us. That he is our great king and our great priest. And that as long as he is in heaven, and that is forever, nothing will be able to separate us from your love. We praise you, our great God and King. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.